you have made the big decision to sleep train your baby toddler or preschooler and you have the method you've got the schedule you've got the sleep environment you're totally set up ready to go with your sleep plan in hand now that you're about to implement you're wondering what to expect i'm going to tell you all about what to expect throughout the course of your sleep training journey hi my name is sarah basio and as the owner and one of the certified pediatric sleep experts of Yours and Baby Sleep. I have worked one-on-one -on -one with over 500 families in one of my sleep training support programs. I love working with children ages zero to eight and their parents to empower them to make sleep a priority in their household. Getting right into night one. Night one is gonna be the toughest night that you walk through. So I want you to set realistic expectations for yourself about what that will look like with your child's sleep. Depending on the method that you chose, your child may cry for an extended period of time. When we choose a more involved method, like chair method, for our littler kids, so for our babies, we might see an extended period of crying. So you might see that they will be crying intermittently, which means on and off for maybe 30 to 45 minutes. If you chose chimed checks for your little ones, for our babies under the age of 12 months old, you're gonna see that the crying is definitely less than if you chose chair method. And it might be about 20 to 30 minutes total. I really, really wanna stress and bring home that no matter the age of your child, there is going to be some type of protest and every child is different. So if you do get to a point in the process where you're like, oh, Sarah said on the video that it should only be 30 minutes and now we're at 31, what do we do? As long as you have the plan and you're following it consistently and you are doing exactly what it is outlined, then it's normal that your child maybe is crying a little bit longer and maybe we need the need to think about changing up the method or being not as involved because our involvement may actually be the piece that's upsetting them and not supporting them. For our toddlers, it's the exact opposite. So usually, usually with our toddlers, the chair method produces less protest and time checks produces more. However, regardless of what method you choose to run with your toddler, we can expect that they will be protesting for considerably longer amount of time on night one than a baby would. They have will, in addition to trying to learn a new skill. So a baby is doesn't have will, right? Like it's just purely, I need to learn this. Okay, I'm tired, I'm gonna fall asleep in this new way. I'm gonna practice that through learning opportunities and I'm gonna be done. A toddler has lots of behavior, is able to pick their own choices in situations, is able to decide, I want this, I want that. No, I won't right? That's will. So this is going to result likely in more protests. So I always am upfront and honest with my toddler families. You may be looking at a hour, sometimes even more. Worst case scenario that I've seen with a toddler was about two hours on night one. The good news, no matter the age, no matter the method, is that night one should be the worst night that you experience. And if you can mentally prepare yourself for the crying that will ensue, Make sure that you're rating the crying on a scale from zero to 10 to assess their needs. And then being sure to stick to that plan and stay consistent. This is the last time you'll experience that level of intensity before we start to see some learning progress. I actually wanna to touch on that a little bit. So crying level zero to 10 and rating it. What I teach my families is that I want you to rate their cries at a one. If it's just like a, I'm angry, I need a manager, I'm being a Karen, why me cry, right? A 10 is like, I am next level banshee cry. And then there's somewhere in the middle. If your child's a one to a five, they really don't need you, right? They're whining, they're complaining, they're frustrated with the process, but they're not calling out and saying, I need help. If they're a six to a 10, this is a great time to be checking in on them according to the time check-in schedule that you're following or providing a little bit more additional support if you are sitting in the chair by putting your hands on. Always making sure that we're supporting, but just for a brief period of time to still give them the space to learn. So it's a great combination of being able to be there and support, let them know you're still there, that you love them, but you are teaching them a new skill through independent learning opportunities. What you should expect is that eventually we're gonna fluctuate between those two gaps. We might fluctuate from an eight 
to a two. It might be 30 seconds at an eight and then we're spending two minutes at a two. And then we might spend a minute at a seven and then we're spending five minutes at a one. This is what we can expect with intermittent crying throughout the sleep training process. After your child does finally fall asleep, there's a few things that could happen. Best case scenario, they sleep completely through the night and you've done it. All they needed was a little bedtime modification and they caught on. That's great, I would do a happy dance and hope that it's not beginner's luck. Although it really might not be, it just might be the extra push that they needed. More likely what will happen is that they will wake up in the middle of the night, usually one to two times. If there's a night feeding that's still involved or we're trying to wean a bottle or a breastfeeding at any point, we might see more frequent night wakings than that, depending on the child's age. But during those night wakings, what we can expect is that they might be as long as the bedtime was. So on the first night, remember, this is going to be the hardest. You might see the same amount of protests because now they're really angry. I really want the old way of doing things and I don't want to do it this new way. And I also don't have the skill of knowing how to do it this way because this is the first learning opportunity that I've been given. It's okay if they wake up two or three times in the middle of the night. The thing I want you to do is stay consistent. Follow your plan, follow your resources, follow the rating scale and stay on track because the more that we are consistent, the more consistency our children will show us. Let's talk about the rest of our nights. So over the course of nights two, three, and four, we're likely going to see a reduction in crying in terms of intensity and length. So your child, if they spent 30 minutes on night one, they might spend 20 minutes, five minutes on night two, 20 minutes on night three. Again, it's not gonna look this linear or, or in multiples of five, but we should see a little bit of a reduction. Then around nights five, six, or seven, we see what is called an extinction burst. What is an extinction burst? This is a scientific term in behavioral science. When we are teaching a new behavior, that could happen because we are training our brain to do something different. We're creating a new pathway. So what I want you to imagine is a forest, right? And on one path in the forest, literally clear, no leaves, it's just completely clear, um, you know, very visible ground, dirt, where you can walk on and you can see the whole path ahead. Predictable. That is the old behavior that we are trying to break. It's the behavior chain of the rocking, the feeding, the assisting to sleep, the co-sleeping. That's what's ingrained in your child's brain. What sleep training is doing is trying to create a new pathway in another part of the forest that is filled with brush and trees and leaves. And your brain is literally digging to create this new pathway. It takes work. It causes some fatigue in our children, right? It causes fatigue in us. We experience extinction bursts when we try new routines too, such as trying to work out at the gym or go on a diet. We might see really good momentum and progress and all of a sudden we stall. It's very scientifically appropriate. And when it does happen, it's a good sign from me as a sleep expert that things are working. It's hard for the parents because we will see an uptick in the crying or we might see it take them longer to fall asleep at bedtime. Maybe a night waking has come back that's gone away. Maybe we're now seeing early morning wakings or we're refusing naps. But what I want you to do is push through. Again, I, I'll say this like a broken record, be consistent and make sure that through your consistency, your child is getting those really great learning opportunities to get on the other side of digging this new behavior chain. In your first week of sleep training, what you will likely see is the nights, the bedtimes get better first. And then you will also see the overnights improve. So that means that their night feedings are consolidated successfully, their night wakings have been eliminated completely successfully, and we're gonna see a lot of momentum with this first. In the second week of sleep training, this is when we can expect that naps start to improve. Napping is sort of differently in our brain than nighttime sleep, so therefore we need to be consistent for a longer period of time for our children to pick up the skill of independent sleep during nap time. So don't expect any wonderful, great progress with nap times during the first week, but continue to work on them so that they will get the hang of it during our second week together. The last thing to come together during the process of sleep training is early morning wakings if you're experiencing them. This isn't something that children always experience, but some kids will end up getting an early morning waking because their body is so used to not sleeping long stretches of time, right? They might've been making up for broken nighttime sleep, by sleeping later in the morning. Now they're sleeping a solid 10 or 11 hours and their body doesn't know what to do with it. So this is something that is tweaked on and worked on 
in about the third week of sleep training. And it is something that takes a little bit more time for the body to adjust to. It takes a little finagling with the schedule too. This is why it's really important to log your sleep, to track it so that you understand the correlation between bedtime and wake up time. Does bedtime need to be earlier or later based on the wake up time? This is where the plan that you have is gonna be really, really crucial in continuing to solve all elements of sleep so that at the end of two or three weeks, you can wrap it up, tie it with a bow, and be done with sleep training and have a beautifully sleeping child at the end. I would love to know, are you sleep training? Have you been thinking about it? Is it something that is on your radar? If it is, press the like button and leave a comment below. What methods have you been looking into? I have a couple videos on how to sleep train not using Cry It Out by using the chair method and using time checks like I mentioned in this video, so go check them out. Tell me below though if you're on your way over there so I can help you work through it. And be sure to subscribe to the channel. I am always publishing sleep content weekly to make sure that I'm supporting and empowering families to get their sleep on track. And I want you to be the first to know when my weekly sleep videos are posted. As always, from my living room to yours, thank you so much for joining me today and I can't wait to see you next time.